We are back in at it on a Monday morning on 95.7 FM, KCMO Talk Radio. Hope you had an outstanding Mother's Day weekend. Happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. I ended my weekend at an urgent vet for four hours after Woody, our 12-year-old Havanese, got attacked by a couple of Huskies in the neighborhood. So I will uh, get to that here probably at 6.30 and about a half hour this morning. I will dive into that story a little bit more with you. But I'm coming in a little uh, little groggy, just trying to, you know, lick my own wounds as well, screwing up Mother's Day, Mark. It wasn't good. That sounds good. rough. Yeah. Oh, man. It was not good. Uh, it was a total mess of a Mother's Day. It ended that way. The first half was great. I was on fire, man, all weekend. I couldn't have done a better job until about 4.30 yesterday afternoon. So it was not good. Um, and maybe you've seen my photos on Facebook and X, uh, but if not, I'll get you the whole story here coming up at 6.30 because, whew, boy, he's doing okay now, but it was not pretty after a couple Huskies got a hold of him yesterday. Wow. Uh, meantime, you know, my weekend was going awesome, and then it fell off a cliff, right? Donald Trump has still got to be riding high Coming off of his weekend. This guy on Saturday found himself in Wildwood, New Jersey. And he drew nearly 100,000 people out to this rally on the beaches of Wildwood, New Jersey. Now, you know, if you go on social media, you see people saying, that's not 100,000. You know what that is? That is completely misdirecting what took place on Saturday. On the Jersey Shore. Completely misdirecting. All I know is local media in Philadelphia and South Jersey said it was about 100,000. That's that's what I know. And these local media goobers have no reason to inflate Donald Trump's numbers. They don't. There's no benefit to them to inflating Donald Trump's numbers. This is not Donald Trump saying there were 100,000 people there. This was the media saying there were 100,000 people there. And by the way, considering Joe Biden couldn't fill up a phone booth, it's damn impressive. Now, we all know that politics end up being binary choices, right? So there are millions of people who did not go to this rally that ultimately have a vote that counts the same as everybody who was at this rally. That is true. And it's a point I made in 2020. Trump had great rallies. Biden didn't. But 2020 became an indictment on Trump. And people who are going to show up to rallies are enthused. But guess what? Their votes count the same as people who never go to political rallies for either party. So that does need to be said. I don't deny that. But there's something about Donald Trump showing up in a state that has been blue for the better part of a decade and a half to two decades. And even when it was a Republican state, and this is going back a couple of decades It was a Chris Christie Republican state. It wasn't really what you would think of as a deep red or very conservative Republican state. Yet Donald Trump shows up on the beaches of Wildwood, New Jersey, a town of 2,700 people. To put that into perspective, that's half the size of Tonganoxie. And by the way, there's no major city for an hour and a half. It's not like, hey, Trump goes to Tonganoxie. You got a two and a half million metro population, you know, 30, 40 minutes away in Kansas City. Uh, You're talking about a town of 2,700 people on the Jersey Shore that's an hour and a half away from Philadelphia. So you draw 100,000 people out to that in mid-May. And it's not like, you know, the beach season is up and running yet, okay? It's kind of like the Ozarks. Kids are still in school. It's pretty quiet down there right now. It is a sleepy little beach town this time of year. And it draws out 100,000 people for Donald Trump. If you're against Donald Trump and you look at this and you find the big complaint to be, I don't know if it was really 100,000, you're missing the point. Whether it was 78,000, 82,000, 89,000, or 100,000 is irrelevant. The clear takeaway here is that Donald Trump has benefited tremendously from two things. And that is the attacks on him legally and the absolute disaster of a job 
that Joe Biden has done on two things in particular, inflation and foreign policy. That's what Donald Trump has benefited from. You know, there's a reason I haven't spent every waking moment of this show, really none of this show, breaking down Donald Trump's trial fiascos. Because first off, it's very much in the weeds. Most people don't really care about it because they realize what this is. It's political gamesmanship. He's being attacked because of who he is politically. These aren't legitimate trials. These are show trials. These are trials intended to embarrass somebody, but it looks like the opposite is happening. People are digging their heels in. They're actually potentially feeling sympathetic for this guy in large part. It's not about the trial. This is not like O.J. Simpson, right? Which, of course, he's back in the news a couple of weeks ago after his passing. Where, like, the trial itself was interesting. There's nothing interesting about this Donald Trump trial at all. Because we all know what it is. It's not a fact-finding mission. It's a political hit job. But it's backfiring on him in a huge way. And then you got people who, you know, might have looked at Joe Biden back in 2020 and said, we just need the calm old guy to settle things down. Trump's just, it's too much. I can't take the day-to-day drama anymore. And 40 years later, costs up nearly 20%. People have said, gosh, you know, maybe the tweets weren't so bad. Maybe I can put up with some of that. And that's how you end up with nearly 100,000 people finding themselves on a beach in Wildwood, New Jersey on Saturday, the day before Mother's Day, hanging out with Donald Trump and 100,000 of their closest friends. There's so many people here. There's so many people here. Man. (laughs) Over 100,000 people. This was supposed to be, you know, they thought they'd hit 40. So they more than doubled it. But you can't even see the end. I wish we didn't have the press here. I wish we moved them the hell back so they'd have, because they can't see in the back. So many people. Ah, boo. So many people. Like, that's what it was on Saturday. It it was so many people. And I caught a lot of the clips on Saturday afternoon. Uh, I watched some of it in long form on Saturday night. And I'm looking at this thing. And, you know, listen, as someone who used to work, of course, in the New York City area, Uh, Came here six years ago, was working at Fox News at the time. I never in my lifetime thought I would see something like this. Looking at that kind of a scene on the beach, seeing Donald Trump with 100,000 people all decked out, some of his most diehard supporters, I'm telling you, um, if the election were held today, Donald Trump would win and it would be pretty easy. I'm not saying he'd win New Jersey. It's still a blue state. A lot of people there still don't like Donald Trump, but he would win the election. The question is, can he hang on for the next six months? Can he keep that mojo and momentum going for the next six months? And for those of you who are maybe a little more skeptical and are saying, well, gosh, look at some of these, you know, special elections. Democrats overperform. Yes, that's true. They do. But there is a changing of the parties. It used to be Republicans did better in off-year and special elections because they had more suburban voters who would show up election after election cycle, and they were always there. As the political parties shift, Donald Trump has built a coalition of people who really don't show up unless it's for him on the national ticket. Now, that may cause long-term problems. I'm not saying there are not long-term issues with that plan. But for right now, today, for this year, it helps him tremendously. 913-408-7957. 913-408-7957. Now, speaking of the biggest thing um, that is hurting Joe Biden right now, it is, of course, inflation. And on that front, the week ahead is going to be very important. And uh, we'll tell you what major corporation is considering bringing in a $5 meal, which tells you all you need to know about how badly things have gone as of late. We'll get to it next on 95.7 FM, KCMO Talk Radio. 6.20 on a Monday morning. Grab that umbrella, as Greg Bennett said, as you head out the door today. Um, Inflation, big week ahead for inflation. We've got um, economic data that's going to be watched very closely this week, including 
core CPI, that's consumer price index for April, that will be dropping Wednesday morning at 730. So that's happening this week. And of course, with each month, as we get closer to November, uh, that is going to be something that has to be monitored. Now, of course, what's done is done. That's the thing about inflation. Like, it doesn't go away. When they say inflation is down, it doesn't mean that prices are down. It just means that they're not going up as quickly as they were one year ago. But inflation compounds, right? So if one year it's 8 or 9%, then it's 3 or 4%, then it's 3 or 4%. You're talking about pushing 15 20% from where your costs were overall just three, four years ago. That's the problem with inflation. Like It's not like, hey, yeah, inflation's down. Okay, but the prices are never going back to where they were there, Pops, so it doesn't matter. Come on, man. Like, it doesn't matter when wages are not keeping up, and in large part they were not keeping up the last three, four years with inflation. So everybody is poor. It's one of the reasons that yesterday or Saturday Donald Trump can turn out 100,000 people on a sleepy Jersey shore town in mid-May. It's not peak summer season. It's not like people are just, you know, walking shirtless down the boardwalk and said, hey, I'm going to stop by. Whoa, who's that? Whoa, it's Donald Trump. Like, no, those are enthusiastic voters that are showing up to these events and they're doing it in blue states. Even if they're redder parts of blue states, they're still blue states where it's happening. John? Yeah, not since Snooky, JWoww, and the situation has there been such a crowd <laughs> down there, right? Hey, man, I'm glad you just made a Jersey Shore reference. There I'm very go. proud of you. <laughs> As somebody who was tuning into that in my college heydays. Snooky is easy. JWoww, a little different. But yeah. I even remember the situation. So. Well, we do have T-shirt time on this show. Right before <laughs> it gets started, we put on our uh, T-shirts for the day, and then we really get the show going at about 5.55 is T-shirt time every morning. Mark's got a Seattle Mariners shirt on and Seattle Mariners hat on today, so that's his, that's his T-shirt choice of the day. That's right. Me and DJ Polly D go back, way that, back. So. That's right. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> I'm impressed. I'm impressed, fellas. Very well done. Um, so Joe Biden's got this inflation problem hanging around him. We'll find out more this week in terms of what that looks like and how bad it might be and, and what the jobs numbers are as well. The initial jobless claims come out on Thursday morning at 730. So that is the backdrop also leads into the fact that McDonald's is working on rolling out a $5 meal. Now, McDonald's uh, did not have the earnings report here in the last couple of weeks that it wanted to have. And they've admitted that they have priced out their core consumer. I mean, I'm not a big McDonald's guy, but the day that Charlotte was born on March 3rd, Kate wanted a Diet Coke. It was like, you know, two hours after she was born up at Advent Health, and they didn't have Diet Coke in the building. I know. I know. I'm surprised, too. So there's a McDonald's right across the street there on, uh, what would that be, 87th Street, I guess it would be there, where the Advent Health is. And I run over to that McDonald's. And our nurse, our delivery nurse, is like, get her some fries. I'm like, okay, what am I going to say? No to that? All right, I'll get her some fries. So then I'm like, you know, I'm kind of hungry. Uh, so I'll just get a whole meal. So I got the McChicken. Medium McChicken. That's a medium drink, medium fry. Nothing crazy. I'm not, you know, a supersize me guy. Was over 10 bucks in Overland Park. Or is that Lenexa there right on 87th and 35? I think it's Overland Park. But anyway, it's like... A, 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 over $10 for that. Are you kidding me? In a fairly low cost of living area. That's when I knew McDonald's was getting out of control. So now they're trying to bring back this $5 meal because they've admitted that they've you know lost customers after rising and raising their costs during inflation. So the affordable meal could include the choice of either a McChicken, a McDouble, or a four-piece chicken nuggets with fries and drink. No, John, there's not a, an option for a half a filet of fish with I was going to say, at that price, it's only going to be a little uh, bit of a fish. Thing. Yeah, yeah, you're getting a half a filet or something like that for five. <laughs> Soup and a half a sandwich. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Four-piece chicken nugget with a fries and a drink. Four pe- that's well, a happy meal. Exactly. Well, that's where I was going here with this, Mark. I'm glad you brought it up. A four-piece nugget. After that, I'm like, well, all right, what am I eating now? Like, that's not a meal. Do I get a toy? Yeah, I mean, Claire's not satisfied with four chicken nuggets. She's five years old. 
And those McDonald's chicken nuggets, I feel like when I had them last, and maybe it's just because I'm an adult now, but they're more fried and less chicken than they used to be. Like, literally, the, the, the chicken nuggets that we get frozen from Sam's or Costco have more chicken in them than the McDonald's chicken nuggets. So this is not like a legitimate option for five bucks. I'm going to need two of those. I'm back to the $10 mark for an eight-piece nugget, you know, a decent-sized fry and yep. a drink. Yep. Yep. You're right back where you started. This is problematic. Besides the fact that John can't get a fillet of fish for five bucks, I mean, those days are long gone. Mm-hmm. He's screwed in that department. That ain't coming back. No, no, no. That's that's not happening anytime soon. So it's not clear when McDonald's is going to do this or how they're going to do this. But I saw this from KCTV Five over the weekend that McDonald's is trying to bring back a five dollar meal, and the fact that they're trying to and they can't, but if they do, it's going to be this pathetic of an option. Tells me all I need to know about the costs across the board. And how bad they are across the board. And how frustrating it's got to be if you're running some of these operations, right? Like the notion that it's all going into the coffers of the McDonald's CEO is not the case. You have a lot of small business owners that are trying to run things like this. Whether it's McDonald's, whether it's a Burger King, a Wendy's, a Dunkin' Donuts, uh, you know, Chick-fil-A's. Like they're all oftentimes run by local people who are running them as small businesses, They have their franchise, and they're trying to make it work just like everybody else is. So I never put the blame on them because they've got rising costs on their end. It's just beyond frustrating for everyday Americans that you can't feel like you're getting something decent to eat and be full after eating, you know, five dollars worth of food from McDonald's. And don't discount that. And Joe Biden can tell you how the unemployment rate is low, but I'll tell you right now, people don't feel the unemployment rate. They feel the cost of McDonald's in a way they do not feel the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate is a nice, shiny number that looks good. But the cost of McDonald's, that's felt by regular people. Little uh, parenting advice there from uh, Bill O'Reilly on a Monday morning. And I've seen him interact with his son, Spencer, uh, last summer when Bill and I were hanging out on his back porch there overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. I met his son uh, for the first time, who is a college student. And very sharp, very nice, uh, very respectful young man. And um, Bill appears to have raised him right. But I wouldn't want to be Bill O'Reilly's son getting yelled at by Bill. We'll do it live! Everything sucks! <laughs> I wouldn't want to get that kind of a treatment. Yeah, no, I don't yeah. think so. We've seen that uh, no, behind the scenes. the wrong wrench. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ain't that the truth, man? Ain't that the truth? All right, so uh, Target announcing that it is going to be toning down Pride Month, which is, of course, coming up here in uh, three weeks. Like, forget Mother's Day, forget Memorial Day. It's all meaningless, right? I mean, the real holidays here start in a couple of Saturdays, June 1. Um, It's going to be big time. It always is. Every year it gets bigger and bigger. Not that Pride Month shouldn't be a thing. I don't really care. It is what it is. Um, But here's what's important. Target is learning from its mistakes, Remember last year, there was the outcry because Target, not because they had pride stuff in Target, right? Like we all understand corporate America um, is going to do what it's going to do. But what sent it over the edge is that Target was promoting tuck-friendly swimsuits for kids in the front of many stores. Not in like the back corner, not like, hey, here's, you know, a tuck-friendly swimsuit for your kid. Like, you know, just right as you walk into some of these targets around the country. And they got a tremendous amount of backlash. So Target, to its credit, is learning from its mistakes. Remember, their stock price took a big hit. Uh, They didn't get quite the Bud Light treatment. It's harder to do that to a place like Target, which sells so many different things, right? It's easy to boycott Bud Light. You replace it with... Coors Light, with Miller Light, with Michelob Ultra, whatever. you got a million options. It's hard to do it to a Target. But Target took a hit, and they've learned their lesson. So what Target is going to do is they're no longer going to sell their Pride Month collection in all of their stores, um, including bathing suits designed for transgender people. 
The retailer told USA Today over the weekend the collection will be available on its website and in select stores depending on historical sales performance. That's smart business. Right? That makes sense. If you have stores where this kind of merchandise has flown off the shelves, then that's the job of any business to say, okay, if my customers here want more of this, then I will supply it for them. But I can promise you that, you know, the target in Olathe on 119th Street is not going to be doing bonkers numbers for the tuck-friendly swimsuits geared at children. It's not going to do great there. So have some business sense. And that's where it seems like these corporations were not having business sense. They were too busy trying to send a political message and less interested in just running their businesses and running their businesses different, let's say, in parts of Kansas City than you might in downtown Boston or Washington, D.C. or places like that. Right. So like being smart in terms of who you target based on where your stores are, no pun intended there, who you target based on where your stores are is the way any business should be operating. Do it based on the consumer that you have in that part of the country. But this is a big win for common sense. Because just like Bud Light has done a you know major 180, they're paying Travis Kelsey you know, tons of money for ads. They're trying to, you know, get back to rah-rah, red, white, and blue, middle America, heartland. They're trying to get back to that. And it's not really working for them, but they're trying. Um, They're learning their lesson. And the point is not to cater to maybe, you know, me or you or someone who sees the world the way that we do or I do or you do or whatever. The point is just to stay out of the political stupidity that you've ingrained yourselves in for years, which, by the way, is catering to half of America. Instead of saying, what do I need to do to try to get the most customers I can and taking advantage of traditional America and just saying, you know, I'll get behind every woke cause and I'll promote tuck-friendly swimsuits for five-year-olds and I'll do that because, well, I got to seem sufficiently woke and traditional America doesn't care and they're not going to do anything about it. They realize that's over, that's done. And that's a testament to you for finally, you know, speaking up. And I don't mean just speaking up literally. I mean, also speaking with your wallet and saying, I, I'm not going to put up with this. And they're now fearing some of that backlash as they should just cater to all of America and let your stores be specific based to who their customer is. That's called big business and doing it the right way. Back to blue, uh, just so you know, it's going to be heading out to KCK coming up at the end of June. Uh, we are looking forward to hanging out with our friend Carl Oakman and the Kansas City, Kansas Police Department. Uh, that'll be uh, last Friday in June. We're looking forward to joining our good friends out there with the KCK Police Department. So we locked that up here in the last couple of days. Um, and in the wake of that, This happened on Friday night. One person was shot and killed after he fled from a stolen vehicle with two other suspects and shot at a KCK police officer. According to the Kansas Bureau of Investigation, the incident started Friday, May 10th. A silver Hyundai Sonata was reported stolen. The next day, Saturday, May 11th, KCK PD determined that the car may be in the area of South 7th Street traffic way and I-35. Shortly after, around 11.15 Saturday night, a citizen called 911 to report that a silver car was stopped in the 1500 block of South 7th Street traffic way and that people were running from it. At the same time, a KCK officer was pulling up behind the car and witnessed the same incident. The officer pursued the three people on foot as they ran up the entrance ramp to southbound I-35. Think about this, right? Cars stopped. These guys are fleeing. They're running up the ramp to get to the interstate. At the top, one of the suspects hid in thick brush and pulled out a handgun, firing at the officer from behind. This is a report from the Kansas Bureau of Investigation. The officer was not injured, returned fire, hitting the suspect multiple times. You got a cop going after three guys on foot, Pitch black, dead of night, 
running towards an interstate and they're getting shot at. Amazingly, this cop was not hit and thankfully this cop was not even at least physically injured. This cop then returns fire and ends up killing uh, one of these suspects. Medical aid was then given to the injured suspect, but EMS declared him dead at the scene. Authorities at this point are still working to identify him. The second suspect, a 16-year-old male, was taken into custody by KCK without incident. Third suspect fled and has not been found. Two handguns were recovered at the scene. This is what men and women in law enforcement in this community and around the country deal with every day. Every single day. Not that they're all getting shot at every day, but this could have been any of our 750,000 cops in this country anywhere at any point in time. And the fact that you still have, and it's a shrinking segment, thank goodness, and it's a segment that should be shamed into oblivion as far as I'm concerned, who somehow believe that law enforcement are inherently the bad guys in our communities is so ludicrous and ridiculous. It, it really does. It just gets me pissed. I mean, I'm it's, getting pissed it now. Does, especially on a Monday after my dog was attacked last night. I mean, I, 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 I'm in a mood anyway. So the fact that those people still exist, it's just beyond sickening. And the fact that, you know, four years ago, we sat here having to defend cops ad nauseum on this show because of the actions of one. Doesn't mean there aren't bad cops. There are. They're not all perfect by any stretch of the imagination. But the notion that the field is inherently bad or evil or on the wrong side of history is so gross when you see stories like this. You know, because in the meantime, over the weekend, uh, this is now a number from around the country. You saw five police officers around the country shot in a 24-hour period, including one dead in Columbus, Ohio. Reports are that a brave officer was chasing an active shooter suspect. Think about that. There is a war on law enforcement in this country, and there has been for quite some time. And it is a war on law enforcement that was um, embraced in large part and promoted in large part by media, both locally, whether it's the Kansas City Star and their ridiculous narrative, the local prosecutor's office and um, their insanity. Uh, and it festered over the last four years. Combine that with COVID, criminals are younger than ever. I mean, you know, we know about the Chief Super Bowl parade, uh, the age of those kids involved with that, the shooting there. Teenagers, we know that teenagers are are prevalently more involved in crime in Kansas City and now around the country. All this comes together in the wake of COVID, where young people who already were at risk in their communities got involved with bad people. And now they're 16, 17, 18 years old, and they're full-blown criminals and thugs. Oh, sorry, did, can I say thugs, or are people in this town going to be offended by the use of thugs? That's what they are. They're thugs, and they're criminals. And uh, this is what's festered over the last half a decade. And I just want to put these numbers in perspective for you. Um, You know, we have now had 58 police officers killed this year in the line of duty across the country. 21 by gunfire, 13 in automobile crashes. Um, So you've got 58. You know how many unarmed Americans have been shot and killed by police this year. This is across the entire country, all racial groups. Eight. Eight. Less than 15% of the number of cops killed in the line of duty. If those numbers were reversed, what do you think the media would be doing right now with this? You think they would be rolling around talking about, uh, you know, the war on cops like they should be? No. No, they wouldn't be. They're not doing that. They are not interested in doing that. They never have been. They never will be. So instead, what you get is this. A a, a small segment of us have to actually bring you the data. And yes, I've combined the data with my opinion on the situation. But every single number I've laid out over the last seven, eight minutes are, are facts. I've just shared all the facts with you. What happened in KCK over the weekend What happened over the weekend around the country? Five cops shot in a 24-hour period. One of them killed in Columbus, Ohio. 
the number of law enforcement deaths in the line of duty compared to those unarmed Americans shot and killed by police so far this year. It's night and day. You can't dispute them. And it would be nice if that narrative and just the facts, not even a narrative, but the facts got out there on some of this stuff. Because I guarantee you, if you were to ask, if you were to do man on the street right now and ask people, hey, how many unarmed Americans were killed by cops this year? How many cops have died in the line of duty? They'd never get it right. Because they've been lied to by too many people. And those people need to crawl back into their holes and never be heard from again. Women are paying big bucks to scream and smash sticks in the woods. It's called Rage Ritual. I kid you not. Um, Here is a clip from USA Today on what these female rage rituals sound like. Kind of sounds like my house every night with now three girls running around the place trying to keep my head on straight. But uh, no, that is a uh, rage ritual, which USA Today wrote about and headlined over the weekend. And uh, (laughs) uh, you just can't make it up. As they talk about this here in this video, it says uh, it's time to rage. Rage rituals are getting attention on social media, especially from women. Participants scream and sometimes beat large sticks onto the ground. To release emotion, they're often discouraged from expressing. When people do this and give themselves permission to release their anger, their capacity for joy actually expands. Huh. Sounds like toxic max masculinity. Now. That's what it sounds like to me, John. That's an excellent I point. I was just sitting here as you're reading this going, now I've been told women are more emotionally developed. Yeah. And yet suddenly they find out screaming and percussive maintenance, as I like <laughs> to call my rendition. Yeah. <laughs> it actually feels good once in a while. Yeah, how about that? Maybe we're all the same. So rage rituals have garnered attention on TikTok as of late. They've resonated particularly with women. Women describe how moving it is to see other women embody their anger. And emotion experts say society often discourages women from expressing. Missed that one, too. Yeah, I missed that one as well. Yeah. Uh, So now you have women paying for uh, rage ritual retreats that can cost from two to four thousand dollars for one of these retreats. They Which got, in turn sets the husband off on a rage. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Ain't that the truth, man? These are tough times right now we're trying to get through. Big uh, money to be made in raging. Yeah. The, <laughs> you know, the budget doesn't really have two grand lying around for a rage <laughs> ritual. Okay? I got freebie out in my backyard. Yeah, seriously. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start running these on the side. <laughs> I'll go in on this with a couple of neighbors. Yeah, you can rent out the backyard for a rage ritual. Be my guest. Participants gather large sticks, conjuring the mind to every person who has ever crossed you, every person who ever has hurt you, who's ever ignored your boundaries or taken advantage or abused you in any way. After some warm-up breaths, the screaming and swinging begin. The ritual is held in the woods so participants can make noise without fear of bothering people nearby. Bothering people playing pickleball. <laughs> could, you, <laughs> could you imagine... Just like walking through the woods and hearing one of these things, yeah, I would actually get freaked out by it. They have to gather large sticks. Now, that's a big commodity here after thunderstorm season. <laughs> <laughs> Again, in my backyard, I've got a lot of oak limbs. You know, so well, you can I'm start selling them. I got yeah. plenty of sticks. Yeah, that's you know, a little side hustle for you, John. Sell <laughs> sticks for rage rituals around Kansas City. How about that? Oh, so there you know. You learn something new every day. Found out this morning the uh, Kansas City Chiefs are going to open up the regular season. Thursday, September fifth against the Baltimore Ravens. Rematch of the AFC Championship game. We'll see if Lamar Jackson uh, found his legs. Of course, he forgot how to run in that game, which helped out the Chiefs in a big way, get to and eventually win another Super Bowl. But, um, you know, I love our buddy Kevin Keatsman over at Kevin Keatsman Has Issues, but I saw he tweeted out this morning. I may have to get Kevin back on. He says he doesn't like the matchup. He says so many better choices. This is disappointing. I don't know how an AFC championship rematch is disappointing. 
I, I mean, it could have been the Bengals, I guess, right? Uh, it could have been the Texans. But it's like, this is pretty damn good. What more do you want? Maybe the Bills. Are they playing the Bills at They're home this the year? Bills, yeah. Are, not on the road. Because I, I thought know. that was a road game this year. Uh, maybe it is a road I, game. I'm pretty sure that the Bills are on the – because they had the Bills at home this past year yeah, and two true. years ago. Mm-hmm. They've had them home for two straight they years had them at, in the it, regular it season. It doesn't necessarily rotate, though. But still, I'm I'm pretty yeah, sure. I, I've forgotten. Let me pull where it up I here. I saw the home road schedule. Yeah, the home teams. It doesn't have the scheduled dates yet. Here are the home teams for the Chiefs this year. Yeah. Broncos, Chargers, Raiders, obviously. Sure. Ravens, Bengals, Texans, Saints, Bucks. They don't have the Bills. At home. They have a, they got the Bills on the road this year. So that's not even an option. I don't know what you would want. I mean, maybe the Texans are a better game because they're kind of up and coming. C.J. Stroud, that whole thing. Maybe the Bengals with Joe Burrow, but I don't know. Lamar Mahomes, I don't know how it gets better than that. You know, I don't want a divisional rival. What, Jim Harbaugh coming to the Chargers? Who cares? Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. coach doesn't move the needle on this stuff. Uh, I think that's a pretty damn good opener, John. I don't know how you get better than that right now with those home team options. No, I, I wouldn't want it to be the Saints or the Bucks. I yeah. yeah. Think, so. Who cares? I mean, the NFC South is weak. It's so, more like if, if you assume the Super Bowl champion is at home yeah. to open the game, then your mm-hmm. choices are limited. Yeah, exactly. And, and I could see that, hey, you know, Mahomes has already beaten Allen, Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrows, et cetera. And yep. that C.J. Stroud would be the sexy thing. That's right, what I Texans, thought they would do. Maybe. Like but. last year was the Lions at home, the sexy up and comer, yeah. Thursday night, home opener, the whole yeah. deal. Yeah. But uh, although Andy Reid doesn't typically lose this, so we put CJ at 0 and 1 already out of the box, potentially. So yeah. I don't know if that's good for the storyline. Well, worked out okay for the Lions last year, right? Yeah. They yeah, won sure that did. game. Sure did. You know? And the Chiefs should have Kelsey and Chris Jones there. They were both out week one last <laughs> that's year. That's right. Uh, Mark Mark will never forget that. He lost a uh, lost a bet there. So that's uh that's probably true. All right. Well, I think it's a great matchup. I'm happy with it. I got no problems with it at all. So now the question becomes in part, and this is uh, one of the lead stories on the Kansas City Star website this morning. Basically, what is next for the Chiefs and their stadium? And it's a long piece written by their sports writer, Sam McDowell. And he goes into some of the options, you know, how do they stay in Missouri? What needs to happen? Um, Of course, you got to have some kind of relationship that simmers back up with Jackson County. But you also probably need the state to get involved here in some capacity. Here's the problem for the state of Missouri right now. There's a lot in flux. It's an election year. That's why it was so important to get this done this year to these teams because there's a governor's race in Missouri. And Jay Ashcroft, who's the front runner right now, has told Ray Stevens on the show he would never allow a dime to go to the Kansas City Chiefs from the state coffers. Mike Parson hasn't been that firm, but we had Mike Parson on the show on Friday, the current governor, and, you know, he said it's important we keep the Chiefs, the state can do something, but he didn't really say what that something was. There was no there there. There weren't a lot of details involved in terms of what he was saying outside of kind of some tough talk of we want to keep the team here. They're worth a lot of money to us. But here's the thing. This budget process that is wrapping up right now in Jefferson City is the last one that Mike Parson is going to be a part of. He's done in January of 25. There will be a new governor in Missouri starting January of next year. So barring something unforeseen in the next few months, Missouri has spent its money, its budget's going to be done, and there's going to be really no opportunity for state monies to be involved in keeping the chiefs in the state of Missouri. So cross the state of Missouri off the list for now. Now, I do think Mike Kehoe, the current lieutenant governor, would be more open to using state funds in some capacity. I don't know if it's directly or what that looks like, but Mike Kehoe, the current lieutenant governor, would be more likely to want to potentially involve the state in some deal with the Chiefs to keep them in Missouri to hold off Kansas. Then the flip side of that, though, is is Mike Kehoe going to win? I don't know. I mean, Ashcroft appears to be the front runner right now. Bill Eigel is the third guy. He's a member of the Missouri Freedom Caucus. And he said on this show, no way would an Eigel administration give a dime to professional sports teams. 
So because you're in an election year and you don't know who the governor is going to be, that's what makes this very complex. And that does lead to the possibility of the chiefs being open to conversations in Kansas. But I'll tell you right now, I still don't think it makes the most sense at all for the chiefs to leave. If they could get the entire Truman Sports Complex to themselves, that the Royals do ultimately just, you know, do whatever they're going to do, whether it's go downtown, whether it's go to North Kansas City, that makes the most sense to me right now, one of those two options. Of course, how they get downtown remains to be seen, but there is some speculation that the Royals could get money for a downtown ballpark without the voter being involved. Now, I think that there would be a lot of pissed off people in this town if that were to happen, But there may be a way around getting the Royals downtown without the taxpayer having a say. They may have to pare back their plans, but that still is at least on the table, according to multiple media reports as of late. So regardless, the Chiefs have the place to themselves. You're going to give up that site. You're going to give up that complex to go over to KCK, to go over to the Legends because of these, you know, dopey star bonds. And if the state of Kansas is that dumb, then shame on them. The best thing for the region is to keep the Chiefs where they are. The infrastructure is there from an interstate perspective. We all know the ins and outs. You know, if you live in Johnson County, do you really care that you might be 10 minutes closer, depending on where you're at, to the stadium? I mean, it, like, for me, it wouldn't be all that different. No traffic. I can get to the Truman Sports Complex in 35 minutes. KCK up to the legends, maybe it's 25. Uh, Is that really worth it when I don't think it would be a regional win to move the Chiefs over to Kansas? For what? To get one Super Bowl every 50 years and one Final Four every 25 to 30 years? Maybe you get two of those in our lifetimes? Who cares? Is that worth it? I don't believe it is. I don't believe it's worth it when you talk about what is in the best interest of the region at large. It's not worth it. So then it's like, well, what do you do from here? Well, the one thing, and Sam McDowell did put together a pretty good piece that laid out a lot of what I'm talking about right now. But the one thing he brought up is that there have not been any conversations between Jackson County and the Chiefs over the last few weeks. That doesn't really bother me right now because it's been six weeks. I know in media world, we get in our own heads and we're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? No one's talking. Six weeks is nothing. Clark Hunt could have been on some island for the last six weeks, hanging out, licking his wounds. Like, who cares? Not a big deal. It's a busy time of year for people. It's been six weeks. If we're sitting here in six months and no one's talked, okay, then we got a problem. Then there might be an issue. But six weeks is nothing in the grand scheme of the bureaucracy, in the grand scheme of politics, in the grand scheme of trying to put together a deal like this. If the Royals get out of town and the Chiefs say, we want the full three-eighths of a cent and we want it on the ballot next April, I think it'll go on the ballot and, frankly, I think it'll pass. Or even if they ask for a quarter cent of a sales tax, they can then brand this as reducing your taxes from three-eighths of a cent to a quarter cent, but they still end up getting more money because a quarter cent sales tax is better than splitting three-eighths of a cent with the Royals. Like, that's a win-win for everybody. It it was until Hardee's had their one-third pound Uh, burger (laughs) against the quarter-pound burger, and people didn't buy it because they thought it was smaller. (laughs) So (laughs) we'll have to make sure that part's clear. (laughs) That's true, too. Chris and Liberty, what's up, Chris? Hey, man. Hey, I just want to say thank you to your radio station. I've been driving back and forth to Topeka uh, a couple times a week, and you guys reach all the way out there, which is awesome. I was, I was a little concerned about it, but on my morning drives, you guys go all, all the way out there and love listening to you guys. Well, thank you, Chris. That's nice, man. we got a lot of yeah. people that are uh, making that commute out to Topeka to the state capitol that now can uh, catch us on yep. 95.7 FM. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I wanted to comment real quick about the Chiefs, the Royals, uh, mostly the Chiefs. What I would be curious about, Pete, is if you looked at season ticket holders, people that purchase the tickets – I wonder what the percentage of people are from Kansas versus Missouri. And I think that has something to do a little bit with why they're even considering the possibility of moving over to Kansas. Yes, the majority of people are right here in the Kansas City, Kansas, and Missouri areas. But you also look at all the towns that really support the Chiefs. You've got towns like Wichita, Kansas, 
that are two and a half, three hours away. You got the Hutch, the Salina, the McPherson. You know, you got all those outlier towns, uh, the Lawrence of the world, the Manhattans. You know, those are big populations when you add them all together. And so I think a place like Bonner Springs, the Legends area, it's it's more centrally located for those towns. Yeah, but what about Springfield, Columbia? I mean, you know, you can go all the way through Missouri and find yeah. a lot of job. You know what I mean? You can find a lot of that. Yeah, that's why I say I think it's a good question to ask is like, could they show that type of data of like mm-hmm. for the Royals, for example? I know for a fact the majority of those season ticket holders, they're Kansans, mm-hmm. right? And so they've been driving over to the Kansas City side for so long. It's just the idea of those season ticket holders investing long term is challenging because there's nothing to do out there for the Royals. There's nothing to do out there for the Kansas City Chiefs unless it's just a, a game day situation. But like restaurants, uh, hotels, there's none of that. And so if you at least went over to the Legends area, you know, that infrastructure is in place for those things to happen. And it's also similar to what they have now is it's an easy exit to the Legends. And so I just, I'd just i be curious to look at that data. I would too, Chris, and I'm sure the teams have it. Thank you, man. Thanks for the kind words. I'm sure the teams have that data. But, you know, I think it's got to be more about you want to renew season tickets. You know you renew season tickets, you win. People will drive an extra 5, 10, 20, 30 minutes if you win. It's that simple.